Square Ball Podcast. Hello there, welcome to the show. It's brought to you in association with West Yorkshire Electrical. That's why I'm here. I assume I've been brought in just to do this because you two are incapable. Yeah, what do you want to know about them? I'd like to know what services they offer. Are they fully accredited? What area do they cover? That kind of thing. Well, yes, fully accredited. Yeah. Um, West Yorkshire, one of the areas, but yeah. also elsewhere in Yorkshire. Like North Yorkshire. North Yorkshire. East, maybe? Why not? Venture South. South East. Yeah. North East. Yeah. North West. Do you think they go outside Yorkshire? Yes. More than likely. More than likely. Yeah. To do things like solar installations, mm-hmm. battery storage. Yes. Electric car. I always forget what they're called. Electric car charger. Yeah. You know what I mean. EV charger. EV charger. Plug it in. Yeah. Security alarms. Um, loads of contract work for schools as well. If you uh, want to get in on that action um, and you're in charge of a school, yeah, a lot of their work comes from schools. So uh, give them a shout. And finance is available for work on your home or your business. wyelectrical.co.uk for details. Search West Yorkshire Electrical on your socials. And without further ado, let's get right into it then. The Monday debrief of the weekend's game. Saturday lunchtime kickoff against Huddersfield. Um, Phil, we said the one to watch heading into this game was penalties. If one came up, one didn't. So we can skip straight past that and into, um, well, a debrief on on the game. I mean, you led off your article on Jorginho Ruta, which is interesting because Somerville was pretty much the one that stole the headlines again, wasn't it, with two goals and two assists? Yeah, a lot of players who are in form, a lot of attacking players in, in form at the moment, and Somerville, absolutely the pick of, of them. I think that performance from him on Saturday it reminded you again why it might have been a good idea for him to have taken the penalty at Stoke. He's just finishing a lot. He's creating a lot. He, he's in as good form as he's ever been um, for Leeds. But the more and more that I look at Ruta, um, particularly the creative side of his game, he's not scoring a huge number of goals, Ruta. And I think for a number nine, you'd want more than two at this stage of the season, particularly because Leeds have scored 24 um, across the championship um, to this point. But he's just an absolute level apart when it comes to reading the game and seeing what's going on round about him. He seems a yard ahead of everybody um, when it comes to his positioning and his and his thought process as well. Um, it was... It was so one-sided on Saturday that I was trying to think back to the last time I saw a half like that. And what was quite interesting was that the the very first attack that Leeds had down the left, um, we were sat in the press box and we were looking at Tom Edwards, Huddersfield's right back, and you could see straight away a really slow turn and circle, a real sort of lack of pace. And I thought as well, like the, the physique or the build of more of a central midfielder than a, than a fullback, you know, he didn't really have a kind of a fullback's build at all. And he just felt like that was going to be a, a very obvious point of weakness, particularly because Leeds do have so much pace in the team, because Somerville was out there, because Ruta likes to to drift to the wing um, and, and, you know, put the same sort of pressure on. That was a massive weak spot for them. Huddersfield never, never got a grip of that game at all. And I know Darren Moore was saying afterwards that they had that chance at 1-0, which they did, but it was kind of route one football it was a, a, a miscontrol from Shackleton that gave them that that brief chance um, before Roland stuck a foot in and Moore saying that after that you know it was two quick goals and the game got away from them I thought was quite a, a generous appraisal really of, of their performance they were absolutely dreadful right through the first half. Michael you normally spend your Monday assembling clips for propaganda and we sort of trickle them into uh, into our workspace um, the various links and stuff don't we across the weekend What's the general mood been so far and what can we look forward to on propaganda? Do you think the Huddersfield fans are quite accepting of how bad they were? I mean, I did notice for uh, for Edwards there was a petition online to suggest he should never play for Huddersfield again, <laughs> such was the level of his <laughs> of his performance. People trying to get it debated in Parliament or something that he should never, he should never play again. Um, yeah, there's a lot of yearning for the better times of um, Neil, Neil Warnock, Warnock, which is hard to get your head around as a Leeds fan, having seen that football. But then again, having seen the football, they, well... They didn't play on the weekend. I guess the idea of someone being a bit a bit basic and solid is is kind of a, a tonic compared to that. I think I think it's quite unusual, and yeah, you might disagree with this, but to look at one specific player on the pitch and think that's a definite point of vulnerability that that's kind of so obvious and and you, that you kind of think instantly that will be a problem for Huddersfield. I mean, I think all round. The way they approached the game tactically was was a, a big issue. They were very passive. Um, and you could see in the early moments of the game that what they were hoping for was the, the odd occasion to counter-attack um, with a, a little bit of pace. But as it turns out, I mean, counter-attacking is really one of the major strengths of, of this Leeds team. Um, and some of the goals they're scoring are quite reminiscent of the, the counter-attacking goals that they used to score on Bielsa's watch, particularly in the Championship. You know, he, he always played Bielsa 
front foot football was always possession based, heavily possession based. But it was like a hidden strength of that team that they could counter you um, as well as anybody else in, in the division. And that's the thing with Leeds. If you get caught up field and, and caught in areas where you can't recover quickly, they will hurt you. Um, and that happened time and again on Saturday. I mean, I, I thought 4-0 at halftime flattered Huddersfield um, to quite a large degree. There were so many chances in the half that you were kind of hoping that that was going to run on to 5-0, 6-0, 7-0. And Michael saying there, you know, them hoping for the... the uh, uh, pining for the good times of Warnock. I mean, the period under Warnock weren't particularly good times either. You know, it was all a bit um it was all a bit wishy washy, all wasn't really going anywhere. But suddenly you look at Dan Moore and think he's got a he's got a really big job on there. And they might be very grateful for the fact that the three teams at the bottom of the league seem to be pretty dreadful. That counter attacking strength actually really, really visible and in evidence um with Piru and how deep he was at times and he set up the goal, didn't he, where he just sent it through midfield and we broke on Huddersfield and um, and away you go uh, for not the first time in the afternoon. But he was almost like on the edge of our own area there, getting things going. And it was highlighted, wasn't it, by Farker in the post-match that he was, uh, it was not necessarily his sort of game. And that goal was evidence, I think, of why. Yeah, um, but also evidence of what I was saying at the start about Ruta, you know, just the, the vision to and, and the, the good sense to delay the pass until, until it was given Somerville um, the best chance of doing something with it. There is a lot of pace in this team, but there's also a lot of skill um, and a lot of kind of inherent talent. And again, that first touch from Somerville as the ball comes over is absolutely beautiful. And that really, um, after the route of pass, is, is what sets the chance up. The fact that he's able to get up to full speed straight away and with, with space to to run into. It's interesting with Ruta because, um, uh, with Piro, sorry, because I, I think I said a, a few weeks back and before we got that long answer from Farker, that this was probably going to be a debate that ran all the way through the season about the way Pirro is being used and whether or not it's going to maximise, I don't think necessarily his, his impact, but his, his goal scoring more than anything. And I, I suspect, and I'm saying this in the, the article that, 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 that published yesterday, I suspect Farker would probably accept that if Pirro was at nine, he would score more goals than he is at the moment. And I think looking at Ruta and the way he plays, you can see why he would be massively effective at 10 because that's the pocket that he's dropping into constantly. We, we pulled some graphics together showing that how much he's creating from that particular area. And, you know, it's, I was I was looking at his tally of big chances. It's bigger than, I think, um, or higher than about five clubs um, in the championship, you know, him alone. He's just been so creative right, right the way through. But it would be pretty disingenuous to say that there's a problem with, um, with Farker's attack when they're averaging two goals a game when they're the third in, in the division. And I think the point with Pirro is that it really what Farker said, if you moved him to nine, he might score more goals individually, but would it work as well? Um, you don't, you'd only find that out if you actually did the experiment and and went for it and, and saw what happened. But you might actually find that shifting Pirro into nine makes Leeds less effective all round. Because um, attacking wise, they're not struggling on that front. Positionally, now I am saying this tongue in cheek, of course, um, but I think, I think there's maybe a crumb of truth in this. Uh, Ruta is less of a position, more of a vibe. He kind of just goes and does what he wants, doesn't he, where he wants. And yeah. just make, he just makes magical things happen. Well, I was thinking about this afterwards. He's a bit of a free spirit, really, isn't he? And the championship has become such a kind of structured, tactically structured um, division where everything's drilled and everything is set up to... I think in, in a lot of cases to, to play the percentages really, to maximise overall team performance as opposed to, and the player I was thinking of was Tarad, um at QPR who, who um, got them promoted under Warnock and was quite similar really. Um, you know, like you say, just did his own thing. And it's not that, that Ruter isn't, it doesn't have a place in the system and it's not as if he doesn't know what he's doing and it's not as if he's not contributing to that. But I do like the fact that you do just get that little bit of off-the-cuff flair that isn't that evident right the way through the division. You know, I just think more and more, looking at him, he is that he's in that class of player that money can't buy you in the championship. If you're a championship club and you don't have Ruta, you can't get him. Um, Leeds have got him by virtue of the fact they spent a lot of money on him when they were in the Premier League. But he should be a massive asset right the way through. Um, and I already think you're looking at, you know, potential player of the year for Leeds. Absolutely. Ampadu as well. He's just been, uh, or maybe he falls foul of being steady. I don't know. Steady and unspectacular, but really, really good. I don't think he's falling foul though, because people are really noticing it. Um, I did say on Twitter during the game, you know, he's sort of quietly conducting the orchestra, but it was a proper Ampadu performance. I think he's been the best signing of the summer. Um, I think Byron pushes him close because Byron's been, Byron was a free transfer. Um, 
has done a good job of solving that position that leads make heavy weather of solving time and time again. He's been good at left back um, and, and he's made a difference to the team. But I do think Ampadu, by a distance, has been the most consistent and, and impressive midfielder so far. And he just seems to me to be absolutely crucial um, in the structure of Farkas' team. I don't think, minus somebody like Ampadu, you, you're getting anything like the, the possession you have, the positions you have for your attacking players to um, to blossom and, and to play as they, they want to play. He's He's been a critical cog in the machine. Kamara was good though, wasn't he, at the weekend? Yeah, I thought it was noticeable the difference between the the Stoke game with him in rather than rather than Groove. It just felt like he's a, a far more offensive player, and he just was making things happen in there. Maybe the weakness of the opposition allowed him to show a bit more skill than we've seen from him as well. Like he was, he seemed to be dominating the midfield in terms of taking it round people and just running it more. I think than we've seen before. I think Stoke's intensity and press and, and their general organisation was so much better than Huddersfield. So without any question. It was a difficult game for Gruev to drop into um, on on Wednesday night, but the changes on Saturday made total sense to me. As soon as he saw um, the lineup, it was the right decision, I think, to to give Archie Gray a break um, and a rest. I think that had to be a change in midfield alongside um, Ampadu. It didn't make much sense to persist with that too after, um, particularly because of the quick turnaround as well. I think it would have been asking a lot of Gruev to have had a significantly um, better game, and I think you know also bringing Somerville back in. Um, Absolutely. And and Dan James at the moment is, is quite kind of funny. And I, I apply this to Somerville as well, that at the start of the season, it was Nonto that we were looking at and thinking he's going to be the big weapon in this division. You know, he's going to be the one who looks, you know, perhaps aside from somebody like Ruter, although I don't know what exactly we were expecting Ruter right at the outset, but with Nonto, we were thinking he's going to be the one who sticks out as being kind of ludicrous uh, being at, at this level of, of football but actually I don't think he gets into the team ahead of James at the moment and he certainly doesn't get in ahead of Somerville um, and those two finishes from James for all that over the years we've kind of criticised end product you know his, his, um, his final ball and, and his finishing and, and everything else those were great goals particularly the first one Do you think Farker's bringing this out in Dan James is it to do with being in his best position Maybe just been settled, something like that. You know, it could be something as simple as that, can it? Sometimes with footballers, I think there are a few things that have helped. That'll definitely be it, and th- there is far more, I think, confidence and feeling of continuity um, around the dressing room, around um, the training ground, than there was last season when everything just seemed to be in in flux and everything seemed to be on the edge. Um, I think the difference in division will help as well, and that's probably true of a few players. I know Melier had that error um, on on Saturday, which was an absolute gimme of a catch. He shouldn't have spilled that, and it didn't matter in the grand scheme. But you get the sense of him settling down. That's definitely, I think, been true of Strike as well. I think Strike absolutely needed a period like this and perhaps just needed a season, you know, slightly lower level, long, consistent season where he finds himself again having, you know, struggled for form and, and sort of been lost a little bit in these sporadic chances at left back and then occasional game at, at centre back. And I think that's probably true of, of Dan James. I get the feeling that, that Dan James is very much a confidence player um, and it's been able to to develop. Um, and I mean, his contribution goals and assists has been really big so far. Um, but also, as you go across the team, the spread of goals and the spread of assists and the spread of creativity is, is pretty broad and pretty wide and that very often is what gets you promoted one of the themes we noticed at uh, the weekend Phil and do you agree with this was just around the sort of changing of the guard in the sense that um, the promotion team from last time Bielsa's team is now it's now sort of on the way out it's in the decline um, I'm thinking in terms of how Bamford was received at Stoke the penalty miss there were certain boos as well at Ellen Road uh, at the weekend Ailing clearly um on the way now, Cooper slightly unsettles the defence. You know, when you when you lose Rodon and put Cooper in, you've got two lefties in there. Just that sense that you lose a few percent in terms of in terms of output. And it just became really stark and obvious to me, I think, at the weekend, uh, that 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 generation of players is kind of is now on the periphery and is almost being moved out at Leeds and a new generation is coming through. Yeah, I agree. Which if you think about it is how it has to be, because we're three and a half years on almost from promotion now and, and times times do change we we got into this didn't we in, in the last podcast where I was saying um, or one of the recent ones where I was saying if you look at the lineup now you have virtually nobody in it that made significant number of starts under Bielsa in that promotion season um, I think I made the point that Melier wouldn't have started I don't think had it not been for Casillas ban Stroik was you know it was very much occasional use um, he wasn't a, a, a main player by, by any stretch and your others have either left the club or have drifted onto the fringes. Um, 
And I think you, I think you're right. What you say about the defence. One of the points I was trying to make about Rutter is you can't pretend that in any way leads a, a one man team or that he makes them a one man team. And I think you saw that with the loss of Rodon in the second half. There was a definite shift from ultra solid um, defence to a defence that suddenly looked a little bit less reliable, um, a little bit more shaky, and, and seemed to have bigger gaps. And it seemed to be a little bit more susceptible to the the very small amount of pressure that Huddersfield put on them. It wasn't a problem and it wasn't an issue, but I think, I imagine you'll probably agree with this, I did come away thinking I very much hope Rodon's fit for Leicester um, on Friday night. I think he, a little bit like Ampadu, has been really, really important in just giving Leeds some solidity and um, some proper proper reliability at the back. Yeah, we saw it at Southampton, didn't we? Uh, did either of you two catch the, uh, the Manchester derby on Sunday? Because I was left with the thought watching that, that as football separates kind of into the financial haves and have nots I do wonder if I mean and we're not as dominant as Man City are in the Premier League if there's a certain amount of that in the championship with the you know the embarrassment of riches we've got particularly going forward that you, you saw that disparity in action on Saturday didn't it it looked like proper leagues apart stuff I thought and then you've seen it again with Man, Man City against Man United on on Sunday where um, Man United can't even keep up with their cross city rivals anymore. Is it is a sort of a, a microcosm version of that in the Championship with us? Do you think and Leicester as well? I feel like this year is probably more stark than normal because the teams that came down were teams that had invested quite heavily. Normally, you you'll get like for example when Burnley or Luton come down, they'll come down not having a team full of twenty five, thirty million pound players. Whereas you look at the size that us and Leicester have come down with, and you went, should, probably should have stayed up, or if if they'd allocated resources differently. I think this this Leeds team in the division next year, which I know we're getting into weird future theoreticals here, but with, with a team likely with Sheffield United, Burnley and Luton, for example, in the division, I think we could probably walk it with this team. Right. It's just that Leicester look pretty good and Southampton as well. I guess they're, they're looking fairly solid bets for the playoffs as well. So the, the division's definitely crystallising now, I think. I think when you get relegated, if, if you... If your intention is to get promoted really quickly, I mean, that kind of goes without saying, but you do have clubs who cut the cloth a bit and accept that, you know, they've had a period in the Premier League. It's going to be hard to do that again. If you do want to, if you do want the immediate immediate bounce back ability, as it, as the phrase was coined, you need to kind of beg, borrow and steal to make sure that you do it. And it was quite, it was quite telling, I think, with Leicester that when they were relegated, unlike Leeds, they didn't have... Um, wage reduction clauses, relegation clauses that, that reduced the, the salaries of their players. And the reason for that was that because when they were signing these players, they had absolutely no expectation of ever going down. You know, they'd won the title, they'd won the FA Cup, they were in Europe, they looked like they were very, very settled. And then it all got out of shape last season. But they have fundamentally really strong squad. And i say it again, you know, I spoke to Robert Snodgrass over the summer about Maresca, um, their head coach, who, who he worked with at West Ham. And he did say, this guy is really good. You know, he'll do really good things for them. And and he has. Um, I mean, you saw it with Burnley, didn't you? Came down, cantered the league. You've seen it a little bit with Leicester. I know there's a long way to go, but I mean, they're in ridiculously good possession at the moment and are just digging it out week after week after week. So I think you're right. I think there definitely is a, a little bit of um, disparity there. And and I, I think if you're an opposition manager like Darren Moore, you must be looking... I mean, I don't think Moore can hide from the way in which that completely failed for Huddersfield on, on Saturday and the extent to which it did and the speed at which it all fell apart. But there must be an element of you looking at the players that um, that Farka has, not only on the pitch but on on the bench as well, and thinking this is nigh on impossible to compete with. Certainly over forty six games. It's funny, isn't it? You think you were winning four nil, four one at home, whatever it might be, and the atmosphere would be rocking. But it actually, that disparity kind of flattened it at the weekend, didn't it? I don't know. It's an early kickoff as well, so those people have not imbibed as much alcohol and whatever. It just um, because it was so such so much like a training exercise is what I described it as on on the match ball that you just kind of. Spent that second half just watching us knock it around. Huddersfield not really pressing to try and win it back. And uh, and everyone was just thinking, right, well, we'll see this one out and, then, and we'll go home. But um, it, it should be bouncing, shouldn't it? But it kind of it flattened it a little bit at the weekend. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think... It wasn't flat in the first half. I mean, the, the atmosphere was, was fantastic. The problem in the second half was that Huddersfield had clearly decided that the, the name of the game was not to con concede again. So they were just basically sitting in, being as compact as they could and kind of shielding leads um, away from goal as much as possible. The fact that they left um, Jonathan Hogg on the pitch could easily have been sent off in the first half, probably should have been sent off for a second yellow in the first half. 
I was watching him through it because I was expecting him to go at the interval. I thought they would replace him on the basis that it was likely that he would get sent off at some point. Um, so I was watching him after half time, and the reason he didn't get sent off after half time was because he wasn't really sticking a foot in, and I suspect he wasn't sticking a foot in because he knew the risk um, if he did. So the you know there wasn't a huge amount in the way of chances. There was the goal for Huddersfield that they shouldn't have scored. I mean, like Farkas said afterwards, that's not really a chance that in the sense that it's not been created. It's just Melier spilling one and and um, Helic being there to to tap it in. Um, so yeah, it. As this, the second half went on, it, it was a, a washout. Um, and you did think to yourself, you might as well have just blown this up at half time. But it doesn't detract from the fact that it's a fantastic win. Um, and it was a great performance. They just completely buried the derby at, at that point. I, I was going to ask you actually before the game, you mentioned in the Manchester derby there. Like, it's, I've gone through a lot of Yorkshire derbies doing this job. Um, and I love the fact that Leeds is a one club city. I like the, the sort of one club city model. But I wonder whether you guys ever wish that you had, like obviously I grew up in Edinburgh, so we had the, the Edinburgh Derby, Hearts and Hibs, and you have the Manchester Derby. And I wonder whether you guys ever wish that you had a bit of that, you know, from time to time, because none of these derbies seem to, as far as I can tell, seem to resonate as much as when Leeds go to Old Trafford um, or play other clubs like like that. It doesn't seem to be on the same level of, of intensity, I don't think. No, no, you're right. I think but I, I'm fe- not fairly unique, but my position is unique in the sense that I grew up in the 80s when Leeds and Bradford City were sharing a division for, for quite a long time. So to me, that felt like a, a very natural thing to happen. And it's only in later years that there was a lot of separation between the clubs and they didn't really spend any time in, in the same division. But that was always fun, having having the local derby you know, to look forward to in that season. It, had, it gave it that extra edge, just that felt like the stakes were higher, particularly when you were a kid and I grew up in Bradford as well. So, you know, See, When the, I grew up, we never played Huddersfield or Bradford yeah. for quite a few years. I know Bradford got into the Premier League, didn't they? In the, was it late 90s, early 2000s? They were yeah. there for a for a couple of years but yeah I mean I didn't actually fully appreciate how much Huddersfield hated us until we got to play him yeah. and I was like alright <laughs> I kind of knew there was a bit of something there but our attitude to Huddersfield was generally fairly condescending yeah and it's the way it still is isn't it <laughs> but, the, whereas the, Huddersfield you said about Huddersfield it was like alright oh, bloody but, hell but I, th- I think there is a almost a sense of why do you actually hate us what is it that we've actually done that means you hate us because we've barely played you mm. until recent times and yet you seem to be coming in with all this venom, but it's just, I think it's just the, the nature and the shape of derbies, isn't it? Particularly with like when you're seen to be like the big club up the road. I will say though, it was nice to just box this one off nice and early yeah. and have a clear golfing class there. Because over the years, we've made these games quite difficult. And like we've lost plenty of times to Huddersfield and Barnsley and teams that we've actually generally finished above in the table. But in those individual games, we've, um, we've actually, well, we've taken a few quite bad beatings in them over the years so yeah it was quite nice to just get this one all over and done with after after 45 minutes it, it's probably actually as as extreme a difference as i've seen between leeds and huddersfield at, at any stage i mean i remember leeds giving huddersfield a trouncing under dennis wise at ellen road i think that was the, the game where smithies played um and and got um got kind of tormented by by the cop um and i think you can kind of relate it to the manchester derby in that seeing that yesterday or, or seeing the result and, and reading about it, the disparity was clearly vast between Manchester City and Manchester United. And I think a little, little bit like Saturday at Ellen Road, when it is that that extreme um, quality and, and class is, is going to tell and is going to tell quite emphatically, which it definitely did at Ellen Road. That's the biggest disparity since we played Bradford City in 2001. I just looked that one up and that one was 5-1 at half time. I can remember that one um, taking a, a similar sort of uh, a similar sort of form when you're just talking about Bradford being in the Premier League. Yeah, six one. Um, Viduka, Hart, Backer, Smith, Kewell, all scoring in that first half with uh, Bowie getting a sixth towards the uh, the back end of the game. That was McCall. Was it Andy Myers and Stuart McCall having a, a little punch up between themselves on That's that it. game as well? Yeah. yeah, could well have been. Could well have been. Um, QPR have sacked Ainsworth and Bristol City. I've got rid of Pearson as well, so we've seen some changes in the championship already. The, the Bristol one does slightly confuse me in the sense that they're middle of the table. They're on 18 points, five away from the playoffs as it stands at the minute, um, but a good comfortable, what's that, nine points away from, from relegation. Steady but unspectacular. I do wonder what they want. Yeah, and if I if I remember rightly, when we were talking about the Bristol City game coming up, that was kind of what we said, wasn't it? They've got a not a bad squad, but not but not a bad squad isn't going to do you anything in the division. So we we kind of thought they'd they'd sit somewhere outside the playoffs, but not in a huge amount of trouble. I mean, I don't know if you noticed when they were at Ellen Road, but Pearson spent the entire game. He's a major back trouble. He spent the entire game sat on a chair um, in front of uh, in between the two dugouts, 
rather than actually being in the dugout um, itself. So from a health point of view or a physical point of view, he clearly hasn't been in a particularly good way. I was slightly surprised by that one. I can't say I'm surprised by the, the QPR one at all. That that has been coming, I think, was was pretty inevitable. And we're already, I would say, moving into that period where clubs are going to start getting a little bit twitchy about the way this is going. The one thing, as I said, that, that is helping, and, and this is actually quite true in the Premier League as well, is that the bottom three look so poor that they might just help everybody out this year. It's basically a race to get... Neil Warnock first, isn't it? <laughs> you beat me to this stage, the championship. That's you, why everyone's everyone's pulling the trigger now. You absolutely beat me to it. I was just going to say it's the activate Warnock um, time of year, isn't it? Although it feels a little bit early. I think he'd prefer to be swung into action after Christmas so he can spend Christmas at home. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, he just seems to take anything that comes his way, doesn't he? He just seems like somebody who is never, ever going to retire. Um, partly because he doesn't want to, and partly because clubs just keep going after him and, and keep um, keep giving him keep giving him work. And it has to be said. Inexplicably. That he's, he's well, his record in those sort of jobs is really good, though, isn't it? You know, and as a kind of easy short-term solution, you can see why it shows no imagination at all. It is, you know, it's not quite. I don't think on the level of giving Sam Allardyce four games at the end of a season when you you're pretty blatantly going down. Um, but it is, you know, there's there's no there's no magic in that appointment at all. Is that you're basically just saying do a job sort us out then you can leave again and um we can all have the we can all have the funny press conference or the jokes about oh you know that, that might be back it might not even though everybody knows that it definitely will be um so yeah you're right i think over the next few weeks we'll see won't we uh, talking of new appointments, then Leeds do have a new um, chief operating officer in the form of Maury Eisenberg, former 49ers man, former Tesla as well, who's um, coming in to oversee various bits um, around the club, uh, is looking at commercial revenue, business operations, support or experience, commercial partnerships, and he will also lead longer term strategic initiatives, including the initial stages of our stadium redevelopment plans. Said the statement that's on the website. A, there's quite a lot of work on his hands, that isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's just toilet seats. The stadium redevelopment plans for now, I think. Yeah, <laughs> just getting some of the basics in. Get the pie off the wall. Get some new hand dryers in. <laughs> we we had this conversation didn't we, about um, chief operating officer in the in the pipeline, and this is part of the the forty nine is trying to broaden out the manage management structure at Ellen Road. He will, from my understanding, be kind of below Angus Kinnear in the the chain of command, but it is still a really senior position. He's well known to the 49ers. He was involved in their um, stadium redevelopment over there. I think that'll be a massive focus of of his job. Um, And as I've said before, the the impression the 49ers had of Leeds was that irrespective of three years in the Premier League, they didn't have a Premier League infrastructure, didn't want really close to to having one. And this is, I don't think this will be the last appointment we see. I think there'll be other people who, who arrive in kind of similar roles or, or at that kind of level to, to broaden things out. Um, but yeah, well known to the 49ers and, and not surprised that it's him. Yeah, there is a lot of work to do behind the scenes. Like um, you hear anecdotally as well about things like they don't have any customer relationship management software, like a single central database of being able to speak to customers so they don't necessarily know who who buys the shirts and the match tickets and you know buys commercial services from the club in one single place do they there's, there's various databases i think they've got at the club so things like bringing all that under one umbrella will really really help them because i know that like the 49 is a very sort of data focused it's all very progressive and modern isn't it i don't think pound for pound any given how big leads are i don't think any club has been more affected by being out of the premier league at the precise moment where they they were and the various ownership issues that they had the the lack of investment in internal infrastructure so you know management management um makeup and everything else but also the the bricks and mortar of the stadium and the training ground and and all of that it, it has been it's kind of been two decades that passed leads by at a point where everybody else was cashing in and everybody else was upgrading and everybody else was either redeveloping the stadium or moving stadium or, or whatever else um, and Leeds were left to to stand still. And as you say quite a lot, if you stand still in football, you, you go backwards, and that's that's absolutely true. Um, I wonder how soon it'll be that we hear about you know the stadium plans moving forward. I don't think the 49ers want to wait long in doing that. Um, I mean, there, there must be a certain degree to which they they have to hedge the bets a little bit, um, depending on, on promotion and, and getting the timing right. But it does feel like it's a project that will definitely happen. Yeah, it feels like they're not going to wait if and when we get back up, as soon as we get up. You feel like the button's going to be pushed, don't you? Yeah, and I think I suspect that they'll plan and will be planning um, in advance of that anyway. Um, you have quite a long period for the planning process. I would imagine it will be at least 12 months. Um, so it's not as if you click your fingers and you start knocking the West Stand down tomorrow. Um, but they, they'll want to have um, they want to have everything in the pipeline and, and good to go because it, it badly needs to be done. 
Well, as we stand then, Monday the 30th of October, Leeds United third in the championship table. Bit of a gap up to, to second and first, but there is an argument for saying better to be in the slipstream, closing them down, than uh, than trying to fend people off at this stage, isn't there? So, oh, I hate to be in Leicester's position. It's awful, isn't it? It looks <laughs> awful. Um, but yeah. Looking nervously looking over your shoulder. Oh. But um, that's, that looks like it's going to be the challenge for the season, doesn't it? Chip away at those, those points totals up there, if we can do, over the course of the season, and uh, hopefully... I think Ipswich in particular, you, you're eyeballing for a wobble at some point because Leicester look unstoppable at the minute. Yeah, it, it feels a bit fanciful looking at Leicester and thinking, definitely going to reel them in, no problem. Um, I suspect in order for that to even be a possibility, Leeds will have to win at Leicester on, on Friday and absolutely not lose that game. But but even so, the, the, the problem is that you're not just asking Leeds to go on a ridiculously good run of form. You're asking Leicester to start hitting a really dodgy patch of form. They're not going to be perfect all the way through and, and you don't see them finishing with 45 wins and, and one defeat. Um, but they're not looking like a team who are going to shed many points. I'm, I'm with you. I think Ipswich are probably the side that anybody who wants to get promoted automatically need to be targeting at the moment. Well, to the King Power on Friday. We'll be back later in the week then to preview that one. Phil, enjoy the rest of your week and we'll speak then. Thank you. The Square Ball Podcast. 